<laughs> yes. Okay. We need the, the screen, right? Greetings, everyone. We are waiting a second while people trickle in. Thank you all for joining us today. It's awesome to see so many friends joining us. Um, we have about 400 people registered, but I believe that it's sort of split between the, the today and next Monday, which we hope you join us for as well. Um, but if you do not know me, I am Dr. Josie Badger. The doctor is silent. I just go by Josie. And um, we are excited to see you all. I'm going to wait for just a minute before I turn it over to my assistant director for RAISE, Miriam. Hi, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. My name is Miriam Aliso, and I work here at the RAISE Center, National RAISE Center. For transition and welcome to our seventh uh, summit so this is uh, great we have 448 people registered for the for both events so today and next monday two o'clock two o'clock eastern time so let's go to the next slide so to explain how to communicate with us okay we have a um, closed caption caption in english and it's a uh, on your screen, you can click where it says uh, CC, uh, live captioning, live, closed captioning button. And if you don't see it, click on the more button and then you can click on live transcription and select show subtitle as it is indicated on in the screen here. Okay. We also have um, interpretation to Spanish. So, tenemos a Guillermo Cordero. Y para acceder a la interpretación en español, hace falta que vayan a la banda o cinta negra que aparece como un globo donde dice interpretación, interpretation, y hagan clic en ese sitio, hagan clic, y luego seleccionan español y oprimen donde dice mute original audio. Cuando hagan esto, se filtra completamente la presentación en inglés para que puedan escuchar con más claridad a Guillermo, a Guillermo Cordero, nuestro intérprete. And we also have interpretation, uh, American Sign Language interpretation. And to pin the interpreter, you can hover over the video of the interpreter and click the three buttons, the three dots over there. And, and from the menu, you can click on pin. So hopefully everybody can access what we have right now so for the agenda we have um at the beginning we want to explain to you our new log look we have um uh our rsa parent centers we're gonna um present what they are doing and then we have we have a little break at 3 p.m three five minutes three two three or five and then we will have uh everett Dabler is going to present the review, a review of the five, uh, youth engagement toolkits. All right. So what is RACE? Um, we hear RACE and, uh, and RACE actually is the National Resources for Advocacy, Independence, Self-Determination, Employment Technical Assistance Center. And it we work with the eight Rehabilitation Service Administration, or RSA, funded parent training and information centers to provide resources regarding the transition and increase the capacity to serve youth and young adults with disabilities and their families. So the race is charged with supporting, our job is to support the eight RSA PTIs. And you will hear from them, you will know who they are and where are they located, which I think is coming up on the next slide. The next slide is us, the team. 
the team has grown and um, actually we have one, one person who is not here in the picture, but it's Maria Rodriguez. We have Dr. Josie Badger, who is the director. Uh, we have Lauren Agoratos, who is the product development coordinator. And we have Johan Mora Valverde, who is our virtual training coordinator. He's man maneuvering all the back end of this webinar and the upcoming ones. And we have Everett uh, Dabler, He's our youth engagement consultant. And myself, my name is Miriam Aliso, and I have been in the project for a, a few years already, like four. So next slide. Okay. Our project race, we are on the second cycle. And um, on this new cycle, you, there used to be in the past seven regional RSA PTIs. Now we have, there are eight, and they cover the whole country including Puerto Rico, including um, the Pacific Islands, the Virgin Islands. So the whole country is covered. And um, so the names of the centers are Real Transition Partners. And we have Ways to Adulthood. We have Independent Futures That Work, Project Launch. We have the Midwestern Collaborative we have the multicultural transition TA project, and we have power project. And race is committed to improving employment and independence living outcome for all youth with disabilities through creating a more holistic partnership with diverse culturally responsive materials and products. And we also have partners. Our partners are Accessible College, we have the Delaware Client Assistant Programs. We have National Disability Rights Network, the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition Collaborative, the NTAC-C. We have the National Alliance to Advance Adolescent Health GOT Transition. We have the National Council on Independent Living, the Missouri Parents Act, Pennsylvania Assisted Technology Foundation and Trans and Inc. So we work with our partners to create the products. So we have the eight RSA PTI and we have the partners. So this is a map of our country and how the RSA are spread out, how they're divided. We have a region, well, region A and region A and A1 and A2 because we have uh, eight. So they cover the uh, North East and the island of Puerto Rico and Virgin Island. And then we have um, region B, B1 and B2. And you can see the colors over here. It's um, yeah, areas and we have the region C, it's more towards the Midwest. Then we have region D and D2, D1 and D2 towards the West and uh, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, Pacific. Okay, so the next slide. So the next slide, we have the privilege of having our project officer on today. Um, I just saw, saw you, Tara. Are you able to unmute? Yes, there I am. Hi, Tara. Thanks for joining. Can you just kind of give everyone a little, little overview of the work you do in the new grants? Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Tara Jordan. I am the RSA project officer for the PTIs uh, for the RSA group, which was just mentioned by Miriam, the eight, um, the eight grantees, as well as for the, the PTI National Center. I'm the project officer for that. So I basically are managing all the grants, um, making sure that everything's running smoothly and that they are all doing what they say they were gonna do in their application according to what the requirements are. And I am so far having a great time working with them and the staff and everything seems to be running pretty smoothly on my end as far as I can tell. So I just wanna welcome everyone and thank you all for inviting me to this summit. Thank you so much, Tara. And this is actually, I think, uh, first year we've had you, the um, honor or privilege of having you join us to speak. So thank you so much. Um, as we move forward, um, I think that my 
uh, assistant director, Miriam, did a beautiful job of giving new, the information about this new grant, about the work that we do um, here at RAISE and the RSA PTIs, which, as she mentioned, you will hear more about. Um, but I wanted to also give you some more updates because you guys might know the good old raise, you know, but that was so seven months ago. Um, we are the new and improved raise 2.0. Um, and uh, you know what? I'm so excited about the new work that we're able to focus on and really grateful for this opportunity. Um, we are going to be developing a youth advisory council with the support of each of the RSA PTIs. So we are asking each of the eight RSA PTIs to offer or bring a youth leader with them to represent their region um, for them to guide our products, to review our products, to make sure that we are in touch with what's going on in the schools and for the young adults who we are ultimately serving. We are taking the track to transition in a more holistic approach. You know, employment and independent living are so important and they are not possible if we are not addressing health care, if we're not talking about financial stability and saving money or you know, benefits counseling. Um, and then we're, we're going back to basics. Um, something that I think we go and do is focus so much on transition we focus on these specialties, but sometimes in the process, we forget the basics. That's something I do all the time. And so we are going back and making sure sites, our materials will be accessible for everyone. And so that's a really great um, initiative we're working on with some wonderful partners. So this year, another thing we did a little bit different is the end of last year, right when we the new centers got funded, we did a survey to find out what were the biggest needs and areas of interest um, from those centers. And so we used that along with a needs assessment to develop our technical assistance plan for this year. As you can see, we've done inclusion, access, mental health, COVID and transition, youth and collective empowerment. This month, we'll have a newsletter and a blog on emergency preparedness. Um, July and August, we left fluid for the needs of everyone because things pop up such as the pandemic who, you know, that we didn't schedule for. So we wanted to make sure to have that flexibility as needed. Um, then we moved to assistive technology, employment, benefits and personal finance, and making good decisions and addiction. So dealing with drug addiction, alcohol, how to avoid it, prevent it, but how to get help. Um, and so this, we use this calendar to schedule our blogs, our newsletters, we try to do webinars with them, and there will be more talks um, starting in January, we'll probably release the next round. And I'm really excited to show you is our new website. And I'm going to pause the screen so we can pull it up. Now, this website that you will be seeing um, is brand new. It's actually not even released yet. It's that new. And so we're going to give you a sneak peek on what this website is going to look like. And we'll do a big announcement and release, but we're, because you guys are with us today, we wanted to make sure that you all saw it. So I'm pulling it up. Let me share my screen again. But a lot of the stuff that's on here is information or requests that you all had requested that you wanted more resources you wanted a different format um, and obviously we are still um, working on making sure that we are responsive to all of the requests but this is the look of our new site um, so as you scroll down there's a lot more interactive i think it looks beautiful it is screen reader friendly um, we are also working to make it plain language so that it be no more than a fifth grade reading level um, so that everyone can read it. 
we are this is our new about us page i'm just going to show you a few more this youth piece this is so important because we want to make sure that all youth know that we are working for them and to make sure that they are successful so they are going to be a key to this website and to our future work. So you'll find resources on here. You'll find information about the council as it's developed. And then just some more information on the parent center's new updated resources page. And then as you can see, accessibility, which is over here on the side. This, we want to make sure that there is an accessibility barrier, that we are hearing about it and addressing it. Accessibility is a mindset, it's a process, it's not an outcome. And so it's going to change and we will need to be addressing it on an ongoing basis. So I'm really excited about the website um, and I'm going to make sure that all of you are able to uh, get access to it as soon as it is released. Okay, and then as you guys heard, we have some information from our RSA PTIs. And so at this point, I'm going to be turning it over to our RSA PTIs to share what they're doing now that they're brand new centers, new projects. Um, I think it'll be really interesting. So I'm going to start off with Dawn Monaco. Hi, sorry, I'm scrambling on this computer. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and to see some old faces and lots of new faces. And I really do look forward to when we can meet in person and really really get to um, meet each other. So I, um, I did wanna mention that Real Transition Partners is actually um, A1 and A2. We work as one unit in Region A. Um, we have two leads, which is myself from the Span Power and Advocacy Network and Rebecca Davis, who you'll meet in a minute from the Federation for Children with Special Needs in Massachusetts. And we uh, jointly, um, it, so the whole grant is managed by us, Span Parent Advocacy Network, um, the Federation for Children with Special Needs in Massachusetts, and the New York State Transition Partners, which includes include NYC, Parent Network of Western New York, and Starbridge. And so we work together as one unit, but um, for the purposes of today, um, we will discuss um, all of the deliverables that we do as a group um, will be discussed between myself and Rebecca. So um, Rebecca, I believe is on from Massachusetts if she wants to review the A1 um, deliverable, deliverables sheet. Yes, I am it. here. Oh. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Rebecca, yes, we can. Perfect, hi. Hello, fellow transition individuals. My name is Rebecca Davis and I am the new transition project uh, manager at the Federation for Children with Special Needs here in Massachusetts. Um, a lot, this uh, grant happened a uh, little bit before I joined the Federation. So uh, Dawn Monaco from SPAN and Pam Nurse from the Federation and Leslie Leslie from the Federation have all been very kind to get me up to speed. So I am getting up to speed. And for anybody uh, on this particular call who's answered uh, some of my questions, thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope that I can return the favor. Um, so just to let you know, we are uh, the lead agency of Region A1. Um, Josie's already talked about the needs assessment uh, that happened in October. Uh, each parent center also had a chance to reach out to professionals in their state and have them fill out a needs assessment. And she did mention that action plan, which is um, will be revisited yearly. It's a yearly action plan. Uh, Real Transition Partners plans to develop and facilitate. It's actually... I had to be this. I make this distinction because it's a question I asked. There are eight webinars essentially is uh, about these topics. The first one will be in September about vocational rehab, um, but the the four webinars are specifically for parents, uh, professionals who work with youth with disabilities and the youth with disabilities themselves, as opposed to the train the trainers, which is specifically for the Region A one um, parent center staff, and from those webinars, we plan to take uh, transition related resources, and we want to get them translated and disseminated accordingly. 
and then I can turn it back over to Dawn. So yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, um, we work together as a one uh, group and um, also every one of our centers in region A receive a mini contract funding to um, work on the action plans that they've put together based on the needs in every one of their states in region A. But aside from what Rebecca had mentioned, <laughs> we also have, um, we get together and we convene twice a year with our region mm -hmm. A and in the fall and then again in the spring. So hopefully uh, very soon we'll be able to get together in person, but we've been doing that virtually in the last year and a half um, as everyone else has. We also will be facilitating three virtual or in-person forums, which will include not only the Region A Parent Center staff, but adult system representatives, family leaders, and youth. We also have an e-newsletter that is customizable by everyone uh, in the region. We, um, it's developed by Include NYC and it is distributed to um, throughout the region where parent centers can then um, edit it to include their own state resources and events. And then we also have what we refer to as Transition Tuesday. Again, that is um, developed by include NYC and the trans, uh, New York Transition Partners, New York State Transition Partners, both the newsletter and the Transition Tuesday. And um, so we provide to every one of the centers in the region, a transition uh, resource link um, and a little blurb that they can then take and put up uh, uh, every week on all of their social media platforms. So those are the deliverables that we as a group in Region A will be doing um, every year throughout um, the, the uh, life of the grant. And thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Region A. We are re moving on to Region B and PC. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kendra Wormley, and I am the RSA Project Coordinator with PTC. PTC is Parent Educational Advocacy Training Center, and we are Virginia's PTI. And we're super excited to share with you what we have been doing over the last eight months on the RSA grant. With PTC, um, we refer to this grant as Ways to Adulthood for our trainings and our resources. Ways is referring to finding one's way like using the Ways app when you're traveling. And the trainings and resources provided to students, parents and professionals are guides to help navigate through transition and the next steps that come with life after high school for students with disability. Our region B1 consists of Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. Hi everyone, um, my name is Tammy Burns and I work with Kendra on um, the PC RSA project. Um, you can see here on the screen, these are our topics for, um, that are surrounding our, our resources and planning for year one. Um, things like developing vision, uh, person-centered planning tools such as maps and paths and one-pagers, um, really talking about building self-advocacy skills and keeping the end in mind. Um, for year one, that was our big our big theme was beginning with the end in mind as a way to plan for the future of the student. Um, we, we want um, every student's team to really uh, focus on the hopes and dreams that the student has to support that student. Um, we did all of our year one training pieces, which Kendra will tell you more about um, in our online platform. And um, each year we will have a different topic that we center things around. So for example, year two is going to be transition planning within the school system. Year three will be VR and employment and so on. Um, each one of those trainings and, and resources we provide to the Region B1 um, partners are um, state specific. And so we um, did very um, specific training for Virginia, but also for our other states as well. Um, Kendra and I are going to be sharing with you quickly um, our year one plans, but remember those will mirror the other years and they'll just be around different topics. And we have contracted with partners in our region B1, um, some PTIs, some CPRCs, some DD council folks, depending on which state we were, were working in, um, but we contracted with those and we have monthly advisory council meetings as part of this project as well. 
Hey, Kendra. Okay. If we can get the next slide, please. Due to COVID-19, the parent and professional trainings were all virtual this year. Utilizing an online platform called Thinkific, parents and professionals were able to participate in a self-paced training that lasted for one week. There were total two trainings. One was in May, and the other one was in April. And working with the PTIs and partner organization, each organization received a copy of the PowerPoint presentation of the trainings. Um, and those were made state specific, including the our agency and the Department of Education information for that specific state. There were also commercials that the PTIs and partner organizations made that were added to the specific state's presentations. At the conclusion of each training, each state received a report that included the number of registrants, the number of people who completed and participated in the training, along with survey results. Um, I would like to share with you just one of the feedbacks that we received back from the training. One parent wrote, I just attended the Ways to Adulthood training, parent training. It was great. I have a child with a disability, but I also work as a parent liaison with our school district. I definitely want to share with others and parents and with my district staff. Thank you for putting this together because it was so helpful. I am trying to help our staff better understand person centered planning and the importance of the need for it. The training does a superb, superb job explaining it, especially with testimonials from students themselves. Next slide. Okay, as Kendra shared just now, um, this is a, um, a look you can see here, this is just a screenshot of what our online training looked like. Um, just wanted you to see that. And I know you guys are gonna get the slide so you'll be able to see that better. We can go ahead to the next slide as well. Um, we also offered this training um, across Region B1 in Spanish. So we took this training and um, not just translated in English uh, over, over top of something uh, into Spanish, but actually the training is 100% in Spanish along with all um, self-advocate videos and, and things like that as an individual um, who is a native Spanish speaker and not a translated speaker. And we're very excited about that. Um, that is still open at this moment. It closes in about 24 hours, that, that training. Um, and we had registrants from B1, but we also had some folks outside of B1 reach out um, and ask to participate. So we opened it up and let them do that as well. Um, but um, it was concentrated on B1. All right, next slide. In July, we will be doing our Ways to Adulthood student training. Um, for our training, it will be a one hour virtual, live virtual interactive training. Um, and we're gonna be utilizing some interactive activities as well that we've learned from our train to trainer um, session that we had back in March. Um, the training will be offered at four different times in July and it's gonna vary from weekend, morning, weekend, and evening to give options for students. We're limited to 30 students at a time and for students, ages 12 to 22 in the Region B1 area. And the training curriculum will be shared with our um, PTI and partner organizations in the future for their future use. Next slide. Um, another part of our training, we're almost done. Uh, another part of our, our grant um, is to create resources. And so um, we are in the process of that now. Some have already been handed out to our Region B1 Partners, um, when I, and again, when I'm saying partners, I'm talking about some PTIs, some CPRCs, and some DD councils, depending on the state. Um, but we have handed out resources to them and are continuing to work on some. I'm very excited. Uh, in just a few days, they're going to be receiving this fabulous um, independent living skills checklist that can be used um, in this person center planning process that we put together. Um, if need be, um, depending on the resource, uh, they're made either state specific or they're general, depending on um, what type of resource it is. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. Oh, and all the resources are also in Spanish, I should say that. Okay, next slide. <laughs> <laughs> what you see right here is just a screenshot of one of the resources that we did, um, our parent transition survey. Um, this is a nine section survey that's for parents and professionals to use to document transition needs and expectations for the student's future. And this um, transition survey was done for parent, professional, and it was also completed and done in Spanish as well to share. It covers topics such as student strengths, needs, living options after high school, relationships and transportation, and much, much more. Next slide. Fabulous. So this is our last slide. It just has our contact info. Feel free to reach out um, to Kendra or myself. 
or us at PTC. And um, as you go through these, if you have any questions, um, just let us know. Thanks so much. Beautiful. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, and I would seriously uh, recommend checking out their website. And as, as this year progresses, uh, Rays will be sending out materials from all of our parent centers and posting them on our raisecenter.org site to link you back to their work. And so I'm excited to see what comes out of all of this. Thank you so much. Um, and moving on to B2. Hey, this is Gina in Alabama. Um, B2 um, consists of Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Texas. Um, we are a new project. Um, and I have to say there have been no better challenges than beginning a brand new project in the middle of a COVID pandemic. Um, because what you envision versus what groundwork looks like creates that whole new realm of flexibility. Um, so we're really excited about the work and the project that we have proposed to do um, and that we're beginning. One of the uh, purposes and central focuses of our project is to identify what is available, identify what is working, identify what needs to be developed where we have those gaps and to create all of our projects work around where we have identified need in terms of information, training and support within the six states and as a region as a whole. Um, as we work through our planning phase, getting ready to launch the project and in terms of thinking about how we um, begin this project and do this well, one of the challenges we found is that we didn't have a lot of state specific information available within any of our states that was very usable for any target population, including students, youth, families, um, adults, professionals that serve them and or educators. And so we made that our primary focus and through year one, um, we're working within the our seven primary priority areas, um, including independent living, accessing VR, support for transition and employment, better communication with professionals, developing individualized plans for employment, obtaining information about rehab and independent living, and transitioning to competitive integrated employment and understanding the Rehab Act. And so all of our work is happening with focus around those seven areas. What do we have? What's available? What's good if it's available? And where are those gaps so that we can move forward as a project in developing and addressing those particular needs? Next slide. So some of our ongoing work um, within our project, we have formed um, very, we have formed each of the six partners within the region have formed their own state advisory committee because as you all well know, although we're working as one region, every single state does have its own intricacies, the way that they approach services, the way services are handed down, different entities. So we have formed state specific advisory committees in each of the six states to address those state specific needs. Um, throughout this year, the initial startup of the project, the, the charge of each of the state advisory committees was to identify existing resources related to those seven priority areas that we talked about earlier, and then evaluate those resources for first impartiality, objectiveness, quality, the ease of use of a targeted population, applicability to the regulations um, that guide transition planning, and of the eligibility systems within each state. And so we have been within each of those six partner states, identifying those state specific resources that we have, evaluating those resources once they've been identified. And then now we're working toward identifying gaps where we don't have information, where the information is not there, where it's not good, and where its ease of use is not readily available for its intended um, audience. So moving forward, as we identify those gaps in each of those six areas, and then as a region as a whole, um, 
Our upcoming work will include um, uploading those existing resources to an online resource library that will be available throughout our region, creating new print and digital materials, along with a wide range of learning opportunities to help fill those identified gaps after reviewing those existing resources, evaluating new resources for high quality ease of use and accessibility with stakeholder input, and then de developing the plan for marketing. So all of those things developed by the project will be readily accessible and driven down to the local community level where families and youth are living and accessing services. When we talk about um, our evaluation question overall, is anyone better off as a result of using materials developed by the project? Are people receiving more appropriate services? Are they accessing um, appropriate supports? Do they know that they're available? Do they know who is providing them? And are they getting good appropriate services that are individualized to help support that, that youth and family supporting them? Um, so that is how we're driving our services. Next slide, please. So what we've accomplished so far, again, we formed the, each of the six state advisory committees, and we have met at least twice in each of those six partnering states through um, our PTI centers as the lead. Um, in 2021, the membership includes everything from VR to local experts in transition, um, adult ed programs, just a wide variety of stakeholders, including youth and families um, within each of those six states. Um, all the existing resources from each of the six states have been collected and are in the final stages of being rated to determine usability um, and availability. The collaborative relationships amongst all of the agency representatives within the six states and within our region are continuing to grow as our identified partners are within each of those states. Um, we also are developing a larger, uh, more collaborative relationship between those six PTI centers to help us to grow stronger as a region, as a project. Um, and there's a lot of excitement about our project within the advisory teams from each of the six states um, to see what the project is going to accomplish because one of our, um, our, aha, our aha moments is that we don't have a lot of good usable materials available to really enable and look toward transition planning that's, that a family, a youth could pull down, could access um, other than just general information. And so we're really excited. Um, the partners across the region are very excited about looking to see what the project will do over the next five years. And, and we have many stakeholders that are in the trenches with us to helping us to accomplish the mission. So we're excited about our work. We're excited about where we've came so far and we look forward to the work that we're going to be doing to improve transition in the South. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I love having friends from the South. This is the first time that we've had some of our brothers and sisters down there. So awesome work, thank you so much. Um, and Judy Moses, are you with us? From C1. It might be some technical difficulties, so um, we will jump to C2. Hopefully that is okay. Hi, this is, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Jody Webb was unable to be here. She's our executive um, director. So this is Beth Larson Steckler and I just started. So hopefully um, I can give you a, a quick overview. We just received this eight months ago. We have completed a needs assessment and um, have done sub grant applications and awards. Two did not receive them. Awards were made for 20,000. We've had community of practice and peer-to-peer -peer, um, specialist meeting. Um, and um, our region consists of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And again, like I said, I'm very new, just jumping in for Jody Webb, but I'm excited to be here. Wonderful and welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. 
Okay, open doors. I think Jennifer, are you with us? It appears that Jennifer's not with us at this moment. I think that uh, sometimes the time differences across the country, it's kind of difficult. But let me just give you a little overview both of PACER and of the opening doors. So PACER, as always, does a lot of trainings. And so they have two scheduled for this summer. One's on assistive tech and one is on accommodations. Um, they have previously released their IEP owner's manual, but I highly recommend checking it out. And they've been doing some updates on it as well. Um, the PTI group meeting on PACER's Assistive Technology London Library, if you want to visit, there is the link on that slide. And as was mentioned in the chat, um, there was a link provided directly to the resources in this, um, this direct PowerPoint, but it can also be found when we send out the video recording and this PowerPoint um, probably later this week. Then for open doors, they have had a lot of movement and a lot going on. They are doing amazing work at bringing diverse youth to leadership roles in their um, parent center. And so they meet five times a year and they have a great age range of 14 to 26. They have been working on developing videos for other training. They've worked directly on self-advocacy skills and ways to develop their leadership skills. Um, and they're also developing um, and opportunities for them to present and envision themselves in different ways. For their project, um, there are resources for their PTI, and as you can see, their region consists of Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, American Samoa, and the Mariana Islands. Um, they, as always, are very up on making sure that their materials are culturally responsive and in multiple languages. They have been making sure that everything is up to date. As you may remember, they have been an RSA PTI previously for the past six years. So they are working on updating materials and working with their region for new materials. If you do not receive it already, I would highly recommend keeping your eye open for, or two eyes, how many, however many you have, um, for their newsletter. So go to their website and sign up for it. Really great information um, and a really great culturally responsive information that's really needed. And I'm gonna turn it over to Project Power. Hello everyone, my name is Sherelle Bethel and I work for Peak Parent Center in Colorado. Um, our project is called Project Power, so powering transition and living my life my way. Um, next slide, please. Um, so like the other parent centers that have received this grant, we're doing a lot of work you know, around transition and youth, um, but I, I wanted to share kind of a different vision. So we have different objectives that are gonna go through with the grant, but I wanted to visualize what we wanted to accomplish at the end of our five years when all is said and done, like what, what do we wanna do that's new and different? Um, and so here's what I've come up with. And so we wanna expand our role as parent centers to provide services and support to leaders of already existing established new youth programs um, that can better include youth with disabilities. And I mentioned this for a couple of reasons, and I think that it's a good idea for several reasons. Um, parent centers are already trying to um, increase their engagement with youth. Um, there were doing different trainings and tools and tips, and I think that that's a great idea. However, I think that there are many youth serving organizations out there and they are experts in this field. And um, I think, and they're, they're already serving our youth. So from my background, I've worked with Boys and Girls Club for the past, for 10 years. And had I known what I know 
from working at peak, I would have differently, I would have completely changed the way that I approached um, the youth that were coming into our facilities with, um, with disabilities or IEPs. And so I just think it's important for us to reach out to these centers that are already experts in youth development to help them better provide inclusive practices in their centers and in their programs. Um, I think that's an easy, it's an easy way for us to reach different um, families and youth with disabilities. Um, and I think they can also help us learn um, those those practices of engaging the teens and youth at their level because that's what they're really expert that's what they're really good at um, and then the, a lot of these centers or organizations do family engagement so that's an easy way for us to meet these parents and families where they're at and then lastly a lot of our a lot of these organizations serve youth that are unserved or underserved and so this is a, a different way for us to also do great outreach with a diverse population um, so that's something that we want to work for, towards. And then the second vision is that parent centers will embrace and see the critical importance of involving youth as leaders in their programs, understand options to do so, and how to do so in ways that are empowering and not tokenizing. And I know that parent centers already believe and embrace this um, this model. However, I, I feel like they're still missing youth, youth in this piece. And so what I want to do through this project is to make sure that when we're having any products that we're putting out, any materials that we're putting out are for youth and by youth. And so really putting them at the center of our project and making sure that they are, they are leading this project and making sure that their voices are being heard. Next slide. Um, and so how do we get there? So like I said, we're gonna do, we're gonna create a youth advisory community. And our goal is to get at least one youth from every state that we serve. So we serve seven states, um, one youth from each state to, to help us create these materials, to be youth speakers and to be panelists, to help um, uh, the parent centers and to also you lead our technical assistance meeting. So I, I wanna make sure that their voice is in every aspect of our project um, by the end of our project. Next slide, please. Um, and so we're also going to work and grow with our Region D2 parent centers. Um, I want to <laughs> give a shout out to our parent centers. They've been so patient as we're navigating our first year and trying to figure out what the best structure is um, for creating our technical assistance and community practice meetings. But we're meeting um, for our community practice meetings monthly with our parent centers and then every other month for our technical assistance meetings. Um, our parent centers right now are in the process of filling out or completing their parent self-assessments. And then we're also going to work on doing a community needs assessment. And so and this way, we're going to be able to understand what the parent center's needs are, as well as what the community needs are to be able to bridge that gap. Um, next slide, please. And then lastly, um, our outreach and partnerships. So we'll want to strengthen and grow the relationships that, with our key agencies, as well as explore new possibilities with youth serving organizations. Last slide, I believe. Um, so some of our upcoming work is we're doing an implicit bias training in August. And so we have a speaker, Tori um, Weston Seridan, and she is a nationally known speaker, scholar, and practitioner um, known for her work in teaching and youth programming. So she has written a book called Critical Mentoring, um, and she works with community-based organizations like ours to support youth um, advocacy efforts specializing in a diverse um, youth population. So I think it's really important as we're talking about our outreach and serving the unserved and underserved communities that we understand our biases when we're walking into um, and trying to serve these communities. Um, and then lastly, we're doing a check quest transition guide um, to the future web, web series. So in our last RSA project, we created kind of a graphic novel book um, for transition. And so what we want to do is really bring that book to life this year and, and do some trainings around how, how to use the book and some best practices around that. So that's it for this project for now. Thanks, Beautiful. Everybody. Thank you so much, Sheryl. And I was like back here invisibly saying preach it when you were talking about nothing else without us youth leadership stuff. Oh, love it. Um, and, and I just wanted to say hi. I'm here to support Sheryl, but uh, Michelle Williams is uh, the executive director of Peak. But I'm just excited to be part of this uh, summit with you all and so impressed with the work that you are all doing around the country. So I just oh, we love you guys. I'm so <laughs> excited. And you know, something that's so great about having federal funding is that we can all share our, our stuff. And so if this, what was just shared with all of you is of interest to you, please, please, you know, let us know. So this right now is actually, before we jump to break, because we're a little ahead of schedule, which is wild, um, I want you guys to put in either the chat or if that's not very accessible, 
to you, unmute yourself if you have any questions about RISE, about the RSAPTIs, from anything, or about finding material. I don't think we know what to do. I see a hand um, because we're a little bit um, early. It kind of blows everyone's minds. Any questions? Oh, oh, hi, Nancy. It's you in the chat. Okay. So if there are no questions, I think we will actually move to our break early. Um, Josie, did, Josie, did this, this is Everett. I see some yeah, hand raises. I see you. some hand raises. Oh, yeah, I'm I so see. glad someone sees them. Uh, Re Rebecca Davis raised her hand. Yeah, and there was one other person I saw. Yeah. Ever, can you be in charge of calling on people? Because I can't see people. So, Rebecca, you, you I, had... I, yeah, I think there was another hand as well. I just, I, it wasn't, well, maybe it was a question. I've, I've got to find that, uh, the idea of a, a um, the transit, Chet Quest transition guide, the graphic novel, that's such a great idea. So, that just, I, I just applaud all the great ideas that I've heard. I've been taking copious notes, so. Uh, bravo, everyone, but I'm going to check that out. And may I ask from uh, either one of you from Peak Power, um, where would they find the graphic novel? Um, that sounds that sounds messy, but <laughs> I know we have it on our website. And right now we have it. It's in a toolkit for our parent center, so we can we can talk about how to how to spread that. <laughs> mm -hmm. right now we've just given it to our parent our parent centers in our region. Okay, I think we're going to share that big and bad because it sounds amazing. So we will make sure it gets out to everyone too. So awesome. Um, and then the other hand. I don't know who that was and I apologize, Dozy. I saw it go up and then it disappeared off my screen. But I do see a question in the chat from a Judy. I do see a Judy as well. So will the center's work collaborate with non-RSA centers, such as those funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation? I, we are 100% collaborative bodies. And so we would love to work with groups such as centers funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. However, I think that um, we might need a, some connections, at least I would love connections um, that Riz could connect with someone and you know maybe be able to also connect to the different regions. And so Judy, um, please no, so I please email me. Um, you can either go to the Riz Center, contact us, or my email address, which I'm not sure if it's on here or not, is jbadger at rayscenter.org. I'm going to type it here, but I would love to connect with you and or any other group um, that is connected to disability and transition. Um, you know, if you get a job or you can't get there, it doesn't matter how successful job training programs are. So I would love to connect with all of you um, who have something that you think would, would fit well together. So thank you so much. Any other questions? I just put my email in the chat. Yes. Oh, and thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so we are about five minutes early, but um, I, I think because we're only meeting for a couple hours today, I'd like to keep the break at five minutes. Um, and so if you guys could come back at the hour, which for us is three o'clock, um, that would be great. And then we will hear from Everett. And I'm really excited for you all to hear about these tools that we've been developing. So at the hour, join us again. Thanks, everyone.
We will start at probably about one more minute. Okay. Whoa. Excuse me. This is Jane Arau, the uh, captioner. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Um, I do not have captioning privileges yet. I didn't know we had a captioner. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Johan, are you with us? Yes, I'm on. Okay. Um, can you assign her captioning privileges? Sure. Go ahead and do that right now. Okay, folks, we're going to make sure that these are working, um, and then we will get started. Johan, let us know when we are able to, to go. This we're is Johan, and... She is now assigned for captioning. And Josie, I'll keep an eye on the background. So if anything, we still have live transcription available through Zoom. OK, super. OK, well, now I would love to turn it over to a longtime friend and our youth engagement coordinator, uh, Everett Dibler, to talk about authentic youth engagement and the tools that have been developed over the past year um, to support all of you in that endeavor. Well, and uh, uh, thank you, Josie, and I'm so glad to see everyone here and be uh, in this role. It's my, it's my second uh, summit that I've been to, uh, but I'm honored to be a part of this RAISE team and kind of uh, supporting the work of RAISE to promote uh, authentic youth engagement and trying to give tools and supports um, that can help your organizations make that happen. Um, my, my experience uh, around youth engagement is I have, uh, I'm a person with a disability myself who got involved uh, in the disability rights movement and all of that as a youth advocate, uh, being a part of youth led youth driven organizations. I then parlayed that into um, doing some actual professional work supporting youth leadership and youth development uh, at the local state and national level, whether that be through paid employment or through uh, internships in my master's program, um, which I earned a master's degree from George Washington University with a focus on uh, transition planning. And so um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm extremely passionate about youth engagement and believe that uh, youth led, youth driven is the way. And it's, and it's where Josie said that we're uh, longtime friends. Um, the youth led, youth driven model is where we truly became friends and really uh, kind of dove into this work, but I'm really, really excited about what Ray's is doing uh, around youth engagement, and, and I'm, and I'm uh, honored to be a part of it. So with that, let's get started. Um, during today's session, we're going to look at the Ray Center's new youth engagement toolkit series, and how we're going to look at that is how the series is structured um, and how the series can support your work with youth. A lot of the projects you heard from today from the RSA PTIs are doing uh, or trying to establish youth-led, youth-driven initiatives. And that's awesome, but we wanna really support the work of your organization to best support youth and hopefully it will make sense. Then we're gonna look at what uh, is Ray's doing and our commitment to youth engagement in the work that we do and the technical, technical assistance that we provide uh, as a center in our development of a, our own uh, youth advisory council. And then, <clears throat> We're going to look at a strategy uh, that is actually in uh, one of the toolkits, and it's uh, I call it creating a sandbox, and I'll kind of explain uh, why that is, but it'll give you an idea of uh, w one of the really unique things that's in the toolkit that kind of breaks down uh, how to really be thinking about youth engagement and doing youth-led, youth-driven programming down the road, and then uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some time for uh, a little bit of Q&A. 
But before we get started, and I'm going to ask uh, Josie to kind of man the chat and take a look at it. And I, I just want to know, uh, for those that are on the call, I want to know if your organization has an existing youth engagement program. Um, have you established a youth advisory board? Or are you currently in the planning phase of, of that? And I know there's a lot of you on the call, so I'd, I would love to get an idea of what we're seeing and who's in the room and kind of where folks are in terms of youth engagement and doing that. So I just want to get an idea and capture that if we could. C1 Parent Advocacy Center, yes, we have a youth advisory board, super. And don't, guys, don't feel embarrassed if you're not there yet. This is a brand new charge for, for a lot of the centers. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, and I think that um, the toolkits that we've developed will be uh, really helpful. I see there's some planning happening, different things for other people. I see Kelly Smith says planning. Yes, creating one. Oh, I love seeing this stuff, folks. Yes. Like I said, this is my near and dear passion. So uh, the fact that we're in this space and you're thinking about doing this, um, very new but hope to do so. Awesome. Okay. Good stuff. And I think that this is the perfect time for these toolkits. Yes, that, 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 was, that was the other thing. So I, I'm, I'm really, really excited that there are some folks that are uh, currently doing this or, or, or are working towards this. And if you're already doing things, the toolkits will be helpful. But if you're newly establishing things, I really do think uh, there'll be something for you to look into. So that's really awesome. And that's really why I wanted to do this. Yes. And uh, Peel, I'm very familiar with what you do and your youth engagement program. And hopefully um, you'll find these as well, uh, my other Pennsylvania brothers and sisters. So uh, let's see. Okay, let's do one more chat. And for those of you that are, that, that are doing this or are working on doing this, what kind of strategies have worked when engaging youth? So if you're doing some of this work and you're trying to engage youth, what kind of things have worked or have you seen that work? Anyone can put that in the chat. So virtual support groups, I see, yes. Meeting youth where they are is a, is a really big piece to this. And it's probably, uh, I would say, one of the things that has been uh, a, a benefit of this pandemic, if there is a silver lining of any kind, is this virtual world has made things really, really uh, awesome. Youth organizing the summit, okay? Presentations by youth for youth, meeting youth where they are, being flexible, asking the youth as we develop and do, and do any activities, yes. Who better to tell you what works for them than the youth themselves, right? Anything else? Video support on our website for and by youth. Again, the idea of for youth and by youth. It's a really long one. Yeah, this one says basically like at every step, youth and, and young adults should be critical partners to every level of what's, of what's being used. Uh, we have a social group. So um, hiring youth as employees of the organization yeah. to get their voice from the start. Amen, Diane, amen. Paying yeah. youth for their expertise. <laughs> yes, yes. Again, who better to know this than young people themselves? And, I, and I'm proud to say um, that I embrace the idea of, of being an adult ally in this space and taking what I've learned from other adult allies to support the development of new programs and new initiatives uh, like what Raise is trying to do. And so I really appreciate those, those comments about what's been working. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I just wanted to get people's frame around that. These are all, I mean, meeting youth where they are, establishing an advisory board. We all know it's important and hopefully uh, what we're offering will help with that if you're on that journey or just starting, so. 
Okay, so a, a little bit about the toolkit series itself. And Josie did ask me to not uh, get too theoretical into all this uh, because there is some theory behind it. And I can tell you though, that the toolkit series was developed as a series to be digested and kind of looked at uh, numbers one to five, but it is based around this youth engagement continuum here on the right. And you see that at the bottom of this chart, it indicates that there are three levels of intervention, development, and then collective empowerment. But then you see some steps that say youth services approach, youth development, youth leadership, and then civic engagement, and then ultimately youth organizing, okay? So the idea of the bottom step of this continuum is youth services approach, where things are being done to a youth, uh, and where things are almost being decided for them, uh, oftentimes this feeling like this can happen um, sometimes in schools in an IEP meeting where they might not feel like their voice is heard and the youth feels like things are being done to them. Youth development is really a phase where you look at what skills youth have to develop to become leaders. Oftentimes um, we see a youth and invite them to an opportunity to be on an advisory board or be a part of a program and do that without helping them and develop the skills to be leaders in those spaces. And so we sometimes what happens a lot is people jump over the youth development phase and then jump right into youth leadership and kind of expect uh, different, uh, have expectations that could be a, a little tough for them to meet. So the idea of developing a youth and giving them the knowledge and skills that we all as professionals have. And so that aspect of youth development though really requires the adults in the room to give the knowledge to the young person, right? Teaching them about the system with which they live in and which you operate in at your organization. One of the things that has benefited me tremendously in my professional career is I was able to learn about the system that happens around us from the adults in the room and then was able to give my perspective. But the other part, when a youth is developing into a leader or, or honing their leadership skills and developing those is that you have to be ready to hear their real and authentic feedback. And that can be a little bit of a challenge uh, for adults that are, are new to this idea of engaging youth in an advisory board and taking their suggestions and implementing them. Oftentimes youth think of things or have perspective that we don't. But again, the idea of the continuum is that you start at the bottom and kind of work your way up and so the toolkits that we have available through RAISE start out as the first one is like a foundation, almost like an intro to this idea of youth engagement. The second one goes into youth development and then youth leadership is step three in that, in that phase. And then civic engagement and youth organizing are kind of broken into the idea of empowerment of youth as an individual and then youth as a collective, right? So if you're looking to empower young people individually. Toolkit number four is a great resource. If you're looking to establish a group and do that, toolkit number five is a great place uh, to do that. And I will, uh, after the next slide, show you where to find these uh, on the Ray's website. Now this is uh, brand new. So it just got uh, really posted today for the launch of, or, or for the summit today. So, but the structure, okay. This is really, really important as you're looking at this. This was developed and reviewed by youth and young adults. Okay, and each toolkit connects to that continuum that we discussed already, but it is not a book of activities and worksheets. Okay, it, it is not that. Theory is presented in each toolkit, but then advice and tips for implementation are offered. And so we wanted to showcase in these toolkits, um, what research or what different things kind of contribute to what we're, we're suggesting, right? Um, but then there is do's and don'ts lists, there is charts to look at and different things and different strategies to implement when you're looking at this. But this was structured and this kind of goes into the purpose to inform the staff that are supporting youth, right? So if you are a staff member whose role is to support young adults, and their youth leadership and youth development activities, then this is a great toolkit series for you to get involved in. 
And I would encourage organizations as a whole to look at these. I know you might be in a particular project or particular initiative, but this toolkit can be used uh, across your organization as well. Um, it does provide strategies and tips to improve youth engagement, but it really does focus on moving away from that intervention approach, that first step of the continuum where things are being done to a youth or for a youth, but we want you to think about doing it with them, okay? And again, I realize that that can be um, really, really uncomfortable for some because it's not natural. And the last bullet here is to help organizations avoid tokenism and interrupt adultism. And I've been uh, had the pleasure of working with the RSA PTIs uh, in talking about what they would like to see in terms of TA uh, to kind of go along with these toolkits uh, that we've developed. And one of a lot of them said, I don't even know what the term alt alt adultism means. Right. Adultism is the concept where adults feel like they are superior or they have um, they, they need to be in a leadership position because they know the right way. And within the disability rights movement, I, I can say as a person with a disability, I, I would not be where I am today uh, if it wasn't for the advocacy and leadership of parents and parent groups and parent centers and the work that was done in the beginning of the movement. I would not be where I am today. My mother was one staunch advocate, really big time. So I understand uh, the importance of having an adult in the room, but the idea is to kind of make sure that youth, you understand that youth are the experts on themselves and who better to know uh, about them and what they need than them themselves. And so it really kind of forces people or adults to change their mindset away from adults know best to the youth might know best. And it kind of creates this idea where youth and adults share power together, right? It doesn't mean that an adult can't help drive what's happening or develop boundaries and supports, but it does mean that adults are kind of working with and sharing power with uh, the youth and young adults they're working with. I hope that makes sense. And so, um, Josie, is there any questions? I see some things popping in the chat. Um, okay, there are some things popping in the chat. Give me a second. Is, if there are immediate questions, I don't want to. Um, nothing away. immediate. Um, there is some like kudos to you with <laughs> adult adultism right up there with mansplaining. Um, yes, <laughs> love it. Um, absolutely makes sense. So people are or getting what you're putting down. Okay, you got it. Okay, so I, so I want to show you um, where to find these toolkits and kind of uh, get a sense of where they are on the RAISE website and maybe get a better idea of what, what might also be in there. So if you go on the RAISE homepage, there's this resources tab and then you see uh, this youth engagement toolkit series. And this is on uh, the new website that Josie showed too. We have a page there. That'll be ready when that launches also, but we wanted to make this available to you uh, today. So this top half of the website basically, again, explains uh, in brief the continuum and where and how we structured these things. But then every toolkit here is listed in the order which you really should be interacting with them. Again, the first toolkit is an introduction. The Youth Development Toolkit, you'll see that it says understanding the competencies that youth should be working on and understanding in order to become effective leaders, right? So it'll, it will talk about the competencies and things that you as an adult, you as an ally to what you're doing and the work that you're doing, as an ally to those youth and young adults, what kind of skills you can help foster within the programs that you're developing, right? Um, what kind of things can you help make sure they learn so that they can begin to start thinking about taking like a hundred percent ownership of what they're doing and becoming uh, youth leaders. Um, this then looks, the next toolkit looks at um, the concepts of like critical thinking, decision-making responsibility and service as it relates to leadership and looking at different styles. 
So helping young adults understand different styles of leadership can help them understand who they might want to be as a leader. Um, in the work I've done uh, most recently, we've talked about helping youth and uh, advocates develop their own personal brand. Who do they want to be? What do they want to advocate for? And how do they want to go about doing that? What kind of leader do they want to be? This toolkit could really help you look at what youth leadership could be, what kind of styles are there, and what kind of concepts um, can be discussed within that space. Then when you're looking at the Youth Individualized Empowerment Toolkit, it really looks at <clears throat> how you can help youth understand who they are and, and youth can start to feel valued and empowered, right? So how can you help a youth understand that what they're doing is valued by you or your organization, right? A lot of times what happens is a youth, one youth might be invited to a meeting or to be a part of a board or an initiative. And then what they suggest never happens, right? So how can they see their value and understand that value? Um, that can be uh, really frustrating to a young person who's kind of involved in this. Like, hey, you asked me to spend all this time and don't really even listen to what I'm saying. So helping you to understand what ways you can do to promote that. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, later on uh, in today's presentation, one of the things that's within that toolkit about individualized empowerment and show you what uh, one of the tools and or ways to frame this concept. Uh, and then the last toolkit is about <clears throat> looking at, again, collective empowerment of you. So if you're looking at things like teamwork, um, thinking as a group, and then building a diverse and inclusive community, right? One of the things that can be a challenge is when you're developing leaders, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, right? You bring a group together and there's people that wanna speak and uh, have perspective and say different things, but how can you help them learn how to bring their power together, right? How can you help them gain perspective as a group that unites them and that you help them understand that we're better together, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> Yeah, so that's where, again, so I'll just show you quickly again. So if you're on the Ray's homepage here and you go down uh, in, the, in the resources tab over here, the Youth Engagement Toolkit series is posted here with those descriptions. So, and I think Josie, I, I just realized this, that we should probably also add the link to the webinars that the author of the toolkits did. Uh, yes, Ali Rassock, so people right. can- so people can see, yeah, and I just realized that I developed this whole page and then didn't put that in there. So uh, I guess as my boss, you can yell at me later, but, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but we will, I'll, I'll make sure those get added in there as well so that people can see uh, kind of the author's explanation of what this is. Um, but it, it was really, really cool to kind of work with her uh, through her writing and then have her work with uh, a group of young adults to kind of look at this and say, yeah, this would be really, really great. Uh, for adults to understand and know as they uh, support us through the through uh, programs and different things. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> Can you all see that still? Yes. Okay, awesome. Sweet. Okay, so there are more resources on the way and I'm super excited about this and Josie did mention this at the beginning of the presentation that we are looking to establish a national, a national Youth Advisory Council that will consist of one youth from each RSA PTI region, right? That'll showcase the power of youth led, uh, of the youth led youth driven model. And it will, this council will develop materials that will support the TA that RAISE provides, right? And again, as I've, as I've been saying, youth know youth the best, right? So they need to be able to give that perspective and develop materials that will help uh, PTIs and other organizations serve them best. <clears throat> and then we wanna make sure that, that that advisory council has a seat at all raised meetings, um, giving youth um, a chance to give their perspective and advice on all raised activities. And we're asking that centers, please um, support us in 
getting young adults to this table. Again, we're looking for one from each project region. Uh, the RSA PTIs have been uh, su super helpful to me. We've been doing um, youth engagement snack and chat meetings where we're looking at uh, the toolkits and kind of what else could we do to help this advisory council provide uh, support to the work that we do. And so, and what kind of things can raise produce that helps to promote effective youth engagement, uh, both with the advisory council in the future and what we can do now. And so, so um, if we have, number one, we have a comment we'll address at the end, but there is a question I think you should answer now. What does that look like for youth and reinforcement? In terms of, do you mean like payment of like travel and hotel and all that? Is or that... are you talking about stipends, Beth? Because we can talk about um, yes and for time. So yes and yes. Beth. Yes, if they're being, um, are we paying them for their consultant? I mean, I know, mm -hmm. and again, I'm just new, but yeah. it's nice to pay for hotel and travel, but if they're That's really right. experts, are we paying for their time? That's right. Um, let me let me touch on that. So I will say yes and yes. So we in our grants directly had line items both for the youth to participate and have the necessary supports. So usually that's a care attendant or parent. Um, it, maybe they don't need that, but we definitely put that as line items. Um, we have a line item for accommodations, just accessibility stuff, but Yes, we believe wholeheartedly that when at all possible, we should be stipending these young adults. And so that was a part of our budget that we wrote to get a grant for. Um, and some of it is for their time to just be a board member, but then they have the opportunity to opt in to review additional products, write blogs, et cetera. One thing, um, that I want to mention is because even myself at one point, never at one point, uh, many young adults cannot receive cash uh, because their benefits are a very small amount. Um, we have offered gift cards um, and use that as expenses uh, rather than direct payments when that would harm their benefits. And so it is important to recognize that there are some limitations and so Offering different ways to provide a stipend is important. And it might even be registering them for another event or a different training. So working it out with each youth is really important. Okay. Is there is there any other questions, Joe, that you want to address now? I see there's some in the chat. Look in what age range? Athlete. Yeah, Joe's. I, I believe I texted that too. I, I think it's. I think it is, and we'll have to get back to folks on that. I apologize for not putting it in there. <clears throat> um, I want to say it's like eighteen to twenty-eight. I think Josie. I think we dropped it down. Well, okay. Sixteen to twenty-six, I believe, is the age. Dot dot dot. Then, then I'm when wrong. they're a minor, they should have a parent or guardian with them. Well, and, 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 and just so people know, when we're talking about um, limiting adultism or trying to make people aware of that, it's just that, that there are certain situations where <clears throat> uh, adults do need to step in and be uh, a, a part of a conversation in, in a major way to help direct services and supports when that is necessary. But the idea is that what we're talking about here, I think, is promoting the youth voice and making sure that you're engaging youth and realizing as adults that we need to make space for those youth to be empowered and feel like their voice matters within the program and services that are being offered to them. And so I want to make sure that I'm that I'm addressing that too. So when we're saying to uh, you know avoid adultism, maybe that is a wrong term in that way. It's a sense of being aware that adults tend or can tend to do that, and there can be spaces where um, adults can really help youth feel empowered and make their own choices when when possible. And we can talk about a strategy to make that happen. 
And I'm yeah. going to back you up here, Ev, because this is something I actually told you to cover. Um, so we talk about ageism, like just in the average world, we talk about ableism. And either way, those are places where we have placed power uh, over a different group, whether it be people without disabilities or a quote unquote better disability or a certain age. And it's the same idea. When we are saying, well, you're an adult, you should have all decision-making authority. That's the problem. And it's not about giving youth free reign to tear apart an organization, which I've never seen happen. However, it is about helping them to realize their own power and the importance of their voice. Right, because to me that creates better leaders and it creates better advocates that support our movement as a whole, right? I, I said in the beginning that uh, my mom was the beneficiary of the work of parent centers and parent-driven initiatives. Uh, and she would say now um, that me being a part of those and being engaged in that work early on uh, helped me to be an advocate now as a uh, new dad and person who is married and has uh, my own home and my own job away from my family, um, which to be honest, my, I don't think my mom ever really perceived would be a thing until it actually was a thing. And so, um, but it's just, and, but, and, and to be honest, my mother being the advocate that she was also uh, made it a priority for me to kind of be independent and then realize that um, I wanted to make different choices than she wanted me to make. And I had to like kind of put her in check as a uh, young 20 something to say, hey, uh, I need to start making these choices and thinking about this on my own. I just need you to support me. Can we think about how to get something done and not whether or not it's possible? Can we shift that away, right? Can we shift it away to being a possibility thinker, more so thinking about the barriers that might be in place um, so it gets different. So I don't, want to, I don't want to stay on this negative train too much, but I also want to collect some information or some thoughts from folks about what barriers have you experienced when engaging youth? What kind of barriers are you encountering? So we talked initially about what's working. Uh, what kind of barriers have you experienced? And we kind of want to collect some of this so that we can start to think about ways that we might be able to help people go away. Not people. Got it. <clears throat> You're welcome for the conversation, uh, Jerry. Is there any other thoughts on what isn't working right now when you're trying to engage youth within your programs? During the pandemic, we experienced barriers of youth feeling burnt out by virtual connections, and it became very difficult to get them in meetings. Shoot, me too, me too. Um, virtual engagement is tough right now. Um, so totally understand that. Yeah. We all missed humans. We missed people. Um, so that's a really, that's a really important one empowering youth to access services that may not be available in their communities. And that's a really important general problem for all youth in transition is the lack of services. Uh, we met a lot of our youth in person and the pandemic was a problem. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you know what I would say, Josie, uh, I, I work with a lot of college age youth now. And initially, you know, they were all into this like virtual class, virtual world. Right. And now they're like, please <laughs> bring me back in person if you can, please. That's um, right. And, um, and there's, there's dual sides of that, which you all know. Um, there are young adults that because of their disability or support system, um, they can't attend face-to-face -face stuff. So virtual actually has brought a lot of individuals into the world of being able to be involved. Um, but, sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, but on the other hand, people miss the human interaction. And I would say 
for most of our youth engagement work, it's that human interaction that makes it worthwhile. Right. Lack of youth motivation. Yes, and I think, Jody, that that's a great segue into uh, the strategy that I want to show uh, to kind of uh, wrap up before we do a little bit of the Q&A. Um, let me see here if I can get this to do this now. There we go. Okay, so creating your sandbox. And you can actually find this, uh, the chart on the next slide on the last page of the Youth Individual Empowerment Toolkit. It's page 13. But why do I call this a sandbox? Because the sandbox has a structure and boundaries, but allows for the possibility for creativity, self-determination, and freedom, right? So uh, it is a spot, again, I mean, people, people that have played in the sandbox, you know, there's, you know, there is some boundaries to that, but you can almost create anything your imagination thinks of and you're free to do that. And so when you're looking at creating a sandbox, you can look at these steps that are here uh, within this chart. Some of this might be a little bit small. So one of the questions was, how do you address a youth's lack of motivation, right? Sometimes what happens is youth don't understand what the goal is of what they're doing, right? As adults, we understand what we're trying to get them to do. But if youth do not understand the purpose and what the goals truly are, their motivation will be lacking in most cases because they don't understand the connection. So the first step is really, really important is to provide a goal. And you wanna make sure the goal should be meaningful to your organization, but also something that, that the youth can kind of sink their teeth into, right? So what is the goal that your organization is looking to do with creating your advisory board or your youth engagement program and involving them in that process, right? What is that goal? So you wanna provide the youth that you're working with the goal that you're looking to. And this does require the adult in the room who's supporting this to kind of outline that and then give the boundaries right? Give details and the desired outcomes of what you're trying to do. It's okay to do that. Hey, we brought a group of youth in here and we want you to try to do this. Here's the outcomes that we are looking for within this project or within the work that we're doing. And then give them, if you can, give them examples or, or give context for what is needed, right? So if you're providing a goal and then you're like setting the boundaries, you're saying, hey, um, I have this much of a resource, right? I have this many much resources to give to this. Here's what I'm able to do. Here's what I'm not able to do. So you're almost setting that the boundary of the sandbox, okay? I can give you this much space and here's what I'm looking for. And then you want to explore or look at or ensure that incl there's inclusivity in all that you do, right? So you want to help identify various roles that fit everybody's needs, right? So what are people's strengths? What are, what, what are they good at? What do they enjoy? What, what are those things? And then you wanna provide different opportunities throughout the year. So when you're looking at what kind of goals you're establishing, how can you best use and work with the young adults that you're, that you're trying to target and get involved in what you're doing, right? So you're almost working backwards to make sure that you can include as many youth as possible. And then this is one of the other biggest ones and Josie can speak to this too. It almost makes me laugh, like be flexible, meeting youth on their own, on their timeline when possible, right? So this might mean nights and weekends, okay? This is a big challenge for a lot of organizations that they want to do, they want to do youth engagement work and they want to do them at noon on a Wednesday during a school day, right? Or 2 p.m., right? And the reality of it is though, that you can eliminate that, that barrier by communicating with school entities or organizations that have youth uh, to get them involved. But the idea is that if you really want youth to be engaged, you wanna meet them on their time when possible. And so, 
it allows you, it, it requires a lot of flexibility uh, from adults. And then you wanna encourage all ideas, right? So if you create, if you provide them with a goal and set the boundaries, what you don't wanna do is squelch their idea right away. So let them get, let them get that idea out, right? even if it may seem like it's outside of the box, right? Let them get their ideas out and try to be a possibility thinker. Think about how instead of yes, instead of yes or no, right? How can this happen, right? How can we make something similar happen? But again, this requires the adults in the space to kind of step back and uh, let youth kind of spitball ideas that you may already know. Holy cow, that's gonna be a lot. But then also, explaining them, explaining to them what, um, why things won't work within the boundaries you've set or why things won't work in a particular environment. So they understand why there might be a barrier, right? But then you wanna just make sure that they can build their confidence and understand that um, their ideas are valued. And then you wanna, this is not on this chart, but you definitely wanna let them see the outcome right? See, of, see that what they did works and what they offered was beneficial. Um, and I think that it's also important to celebrate the success, right? Celebrate that success that, that, that you have um, with youth and young adults when they do the work or they do something that is, that is theirs, right? Because sometimes I can speak as a, as a youth advocate, they get so into the work once their, their voice feels valued, they forget to step back and look at all that they've done. And so I hope that makes sense. And Josie, I see that chat lighting up again. Yeah, so people are just talking about some programs that they instituted. Um, SPAN does these quarterly drop-in calls. Awesome. Um, and they've been pretty successful. So that's great to hear. Before we, um, before we go to questions, though, I have... A, a, a video to show you. So I'm going to uh, share that now. Make sure my sound is ready. Oh, did I click the wrong thing? I think I did. I see a PowerPoint. Yeah, that was wrong. Mistakes happen, right? That, let's see if this is the right one. Okay, and you should see the website there. We're gonna switch to this. Do you see YouTube, Josie? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Good. Can you hear the sound? You're good? Yep. Okay, we're good on sound. And this is a really a kind of like a video on the importance of youth engagement. And I think it's a good wrap up before we take some questions. youth engagement so important. To begin, the youth brain is in an amazing stage of development where it has a heightened potential to change. This is called neuroplasticity. Experiences through meaningful engagement can then open up opportunities for tremendous growth and adaptability in a young person. At the same time, by age 15, a person's reasoning ability or their logical thinking and problem-solving skills is fully developed. This means that youth have insurmountable potential to contribute, which can be realized through opportunities for meaningful participation. In recognizing youth's ability to be agents of change in the community, Oh no. Is everybody still there? Yeah. A little technical difficulties, folks. Thanks for your patience. Of course. Let me pause know. it for a sec, Deb. I actually got a message from YouTube saying you're experiencing interruptions. 
<laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> And um, so, yeah, we have thunderstorms here in Western Pennsylvania, and I believe that's some of the difficulties, some of the parent centers we're having as well. Internet is just dropping. Good video. Yes. You're right, Teresa. We will, uh, do you mind sharing the link to that in the chat? I I, I, I will, sure. I will. I, encur I encourage you to, uh, oh, to watch it. Thank you, Johan. He was on it. Good work. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Well, the essence of that video was fantastic. Um, yeah, <laughs> it is. I promise. <laughs> um, but I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And I know we need to be wrapping up here. So I hope that people take a few minutes to watch that video. Thank you, Johan, for doing that. Now it's playing. Of course it is. Is it? Do you want to try again? Sure. Okay. One more shot, folks. If it doesn't work, we're going to go straight to, <laughs> yeah, to go carrying straight to the on. questions. <laughs> Both youth and adults develop new skills and build their capacities as agents for change. Organizations and programs are more responsive to youth needs and wants are strengthened between youth and adults, and an increased sense of belonging for all ages in the community is fostered. Communities pave the way for innovative solutions to societal challenges. All in all, youth have something to contribute now, and this means changing the mindset from how can adults help youth to how can youth and adults help each other. I didn't. I, I didn't want to stop it, Joe's. I. I don't think the the video came through, but the audio did. It. Yeah, it worked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so great video. Um, and I number one, Ev, thank you so much for sharing. And I hope that you guys, number one, check out the video and share it as uh, if it's not ours. So share it as you wish. Um, but check out the toolkits. There's a lot of really great information. Um. And I'm looking, Jerry, I just saw, or I heard that as well, that their problem solving is developed by 15. <clears throat> I would say my husband's is still developing and he's 34. So <laughs> um, yes, that was an interesting piece as well, but aren't, we're all, all kind of developing. Um, and so that, that was an interesting piece, um, but but I think the es the essence of it is is that you can bring youth into a conversation and have them be an active participant in what in the work that you're doing. That's right. I think you're absolutely right. I'm interested on in the research they use, but I think that the essence was they are ready to be in these harder decision making roles <laughs> um, and to be a part of these bigger groups um, at the age of 15. I would say younger, but in different positions. And I also really liked from this video about not just youth supporting adults, but youth and adults supporting each other. And that's something key to all of this. Um, and actually something Everett is working on right now is something for adult allies. And so a, a comment brought up earlier was a concern about youth making bad decisions that hurt their lives. Um, and we we all know those people, whether it be somebody we went to high school with, with or without a disability, most of the ones I know didn't have disabilities. Um, they didn't have role models, didn't have support, or were in a bad group and uh, made some rough decisions. And that is why the role of adult allies is so, so important. I guess I could show my face, huh? Yep. I was going to tell you, but I, <laughs> well, um, because I, I, I think I, I can't express enough uh, how, while we're talking about youth being in the driver's seat and youth uh, being, you know, the youth led youth driven model, but it does require adult allies that will support and show patience when youth are asking questions uh, yes. to be able to understand what you're asking 
Uh, and that's why the framework of providing a goal and setting boundaries really, really help. And then realizing that youth may not really know uh, or understand all of that and being patient enough to have those conversations. And if you invest that time, those youth will be better for their own future and the future of others. Um, I am still connected to the adult allies that I worked with uh, like 10, 15 years ago. And actually you'll hear from one of Everett and I adult allies next yes. week, um, not on that topic, but Michael Storer was one of our allies. And I think that having what I call progressive leadership is vital. We're not saying give control of your parent center or everything um, to the young adults. We're saying that we need to build them to those positions of decision making, of taking on projects and so forth. Um, but that takes adults. That takes people that have right. been in those roles who have experienced things and our adult allies give us the ability to make decisions and take risks that were measured and controlled. Um, yeah. They knew exactly what could happen and they made sure we knew, but they supported us. Um, and I think that that voice, that role model um, that has your back is so important for young well, and it's and it's And it's hard when you care so much about the youth and families you're working with in this space to actually just be silent first and then in, in, interject at the proper times to make sure people know what those risks are, but also not letting somebody uh, take such a risk that there's a, a really, really negative outcome that goes beyond just a learning experience, right? Yes. Um, but the idea that a youth can fail at something is not always a bad outcome. It, it is not. Failure is one of the best uh, learning tools. Uh, I would say failure and reflection, or maybe something went okay, but not great. So let's talk about how that went and what we can do differently next time. So, um, but, I, but I know as a parent now, it is so hard to know my daughter's about to make a choice that might not be great, but uh, that's how we can, yeah, the dignity of risks. Warren just said the dignity of risk. Absolutely. Yes. That's right. Um, so, so I, we adult do allies open live that too. every day, right? They live that every day yeah. when they're supporting youth. Yeah. So what questions do y'all have for Everett or me or anyone or comments? A scouter. I love that giving you a place, giving youth a place to fail safely. That's right. Having that safety net so important. Well, and, and Josie and I have spent time uh, within those other groups like the Scouts and 4-H just to learn how they do those things mm -hmm. uh, and promote this. And, you know, as if you're a Scout leader or you're a part of the 4-H and you're a leader right. in that space, it's the same concept. We just call it adult allies. Right. That's That's true. Any tips how to get parents on board with youth involvement? Great question. Um, one of the things that that I that I would suggest, if you can, is have families and youth that have experienced the power of youth involvement talk about their own experience. Right? Have moms uh, and dads and uh, have parents. Uh, come and say, uh, I didn't, I was not comfortable with this. I did not see this as possible. And because I let uh, my son or daughter do X or be involved in X program or do this, um, it showed me that I can step away and allow her to be involved and take ownership of what you're doing. Um, and I think that parents hearing from other parents, as you all know, and youth hearing from other youth, right? But I think that that's w w one of the things to do. And, and if you're like, hey, Everett, I don't even have an example of this, right? I, I don't have one. M my uh, advice would be to do activities that are joint activities with youth and adults doing the same activity, but doing them separately and then having them come together 
uh, to uh, review what their answers or what their perspectives were. It helps parents to see that what their vision for their son or daughter's future is might not be the same as what their son and daughter sees. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can start to help families see that youth should have a voice in their planning and you should have a voice in their in, in what in what their life is. And it will help families kind of bring together what the plan really should be. But you have to let youth speak honestly around other youth and then come back together with their parents almost as teams to kind of see the difference in perspective. I hope oh, I explained that okay, Josie. You did. I know what I mean. You did, you did. But I hope I explained that right. Michelle, my friend, I see you. Yeah, so I have a funny story in, the, in that kind of context as a parent. Um, so many of you know, my son is uh, deafblind and, and nonverbal. He's fluent in sign language. And I had signed him up. Um, he just turned 18 in January. I had signed him up for a program we have at PEEP, which is the uh, uh, transitions program that signs up uh, facilitators and connectors to them to open up a whole relationship circle. So he met his connector and we were all going to go out this coming Saturday, like their first kind of, they're getting into video games and just kind of exploring possibilities. And he told me last night, mama, stay home. He doesn't want me to go. Good so for I, him. I said that was good for him. He told me, I want to go out with my connector and I want to do my thing and have my voice and you stay home. And I was like, wow. So it was like he on his own kind of started to branch off and realize, and it was great to hear me to just stay back, mom. You don't need to be involved here. Oh, that makes my heart warm. I love hearing that. Thank you, Michelle. And every single time we do youth engagement stuff, there are those handful of parents that are like, my, my child can't do this. I'm sorry. I'm going to sit here beside my kid and they're, it takes a little bit of prying, um, maybe some luring with food or something to get the parents to leave. But the once those young adults are on their own, they flourish. Once they know that they're in a supportive environment that's not going to judge them, they step up. Um, and often it's those young, those young adults that look to mom to speak for them, who are the ones that step out of that zone. And their parents are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea my kid could do that. And that is truly an amazing moment. And I think something, Everett's always been more confident than me. But for me, that was something that I needed was I didn't need mom and dad because these people were okay with me. And that's something special we can all provide. Well, well, and, and Beth said, don't give up. It takes, it takes a lot of time, yes. right? You just have to do that. And the other thing I'll say is if you're doing those, the doing a panel or you're doing those kind of things, you want to have youth that you know will be speaking to the people that will be in the room. And by that, I mean, um, when a person, when, when a young adult who's living on the spectrum sees someone else who's like them, it resonates. When they have a learning disability and they see someone that's like them, it connects with them and they see possibilities, right? They see that and they can tell their parents, hey, I met so-and-so and I believe based on that, that I can do what they're doing, or I can do similar things. So those examples go a really long way. So that's right. Um, any final questions or thoughts of? No, thank you so much for your time and uh, the great conversation. Thank you so very much. Um, so everyone, thank you for joining us um, during our time here. It's been great to virtually see you all. Um, and I'm hoping Fingers crossed, I can't cross my fingers, but you know, whatever that does there, um, that we can see each other in person sometime soon. Um, we're planning on having our a real summit, hopefully next year, um, early summer, hopefully with young adults, which would be amazing. Um, but thank you guys. Next week, same time, same place, we will be talking about transition services. We're going to have some information on federally what's going on with compensatory services after COVID um, and a lot of great information. So I really hope y'all can join us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.